G'day everybody, We're welcome back, we're up to episode 9 of the Vision Board Podcast, alongside me I've got Johnny Stuffgo. What's up guys, rock and roll time. How's your week man? It's been good, it's been uh, busy holidays, yeah. hectic, chaotic, getting, <laughs> getting it done. Gotta get those podcasts out, but uh, we've got to, we say it every week, but we just keep getting, not bigger and better guests, but just on the same level, just these guys that just inspire the world out there, and we've got a special guest, we're a big fan of his. John Wayne Parr today. Very excited about John Wayne Parr. This guy is like the real life version of John claude Van Damme's character in Bloodsport. <laughs> he is a savage, a legend, and all around great dude. So I'm stoked. Absolutely, we're big fans. I remember I was watching his, um, I watched his documentary twice last night. I was, I even had to go to the gym just to hit the bag just for a bit. I was that excited. But before we get on, just if you could just log on to iTunes as you listen right now, just hit that subscribe button, leave us just a nice little five star review. We'll just keep getting people like your John Wayne Pars, your John Goodmans, your Jeff Fenix coming up. We've got Billy Dibb, we've got Austin Trout, we've got a few others coming on as well. Yeah, very excited about the upcoming um, weeks ahead. And yeah, just support the cause. Check us out at iTunes, five star rating, subscribe to our movement. Definitely. And we've just. Uh, we need a few more questions and answers, guys, so we wanted to involve you. So this is your chance to get involved. If you've got questions or people that you want to see, send me a quick email, visionboardpodcast at gmail.com. Yeah, guys, you can also send me an email as well. If you want to check me out, johnny at therealfitcoach.com. Check my website out, www.therealfitcoach.com. What this will allow you to do is sign up for my newsletter. It's free. You'll have all access to my eBooks as well as keep you in the loop in terms of who we're bringing on. Um, getting you involved interactively with the question and answer segment of our show, and just to um, also share some ideas and knowledge as well. Definitely. I've got uh, two ebooks as well. If you're struggling to cook, I've got a cookbook on there with meals that just pretty much you can make in under 30 minutes. I make them. I'm not, a sh- I'm not the master chef, but I'm pretty good. But this just show me My how man could cook out here. You hear that, ladies? This kid could cook, <laughs> he could talk, he could dance, he could box. Show us some love. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Set any date request to Tristan at Tristan Canal Fitness. Yes, we are also a dating service, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> For all of your needs, contact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, jump on there, guys. www.tristancanalfitness.com. Anyway, back to our sponsors. They're the reason why this show can go on. So let's give a little bit of shout out to them, Johnny. Yeah, this episode of the Vision Board Podcast featuring John Wayne Parr is sponsored by The Organic Trainer. Check them out at www.theorganictrainer.com for all of your tea needs, exercise tea, recovery tea. They have an awesome flask. It's portable, so you take it with you while you're training in a gym or in a park. While you're proceeding to the checkout, type in keyword, The Fit Coach, to receive 10% off of all of your purchases. The second sponsor for this version of the podcast is Jackrabbit Slim's Barbershop. If you're in the Sydney, Australia area, King's Cross, Potts Point, check Dre out. Do a booking. He's always packed. He'll clean your hair up, clean your game up, make you looking good for the ladies. Absolutely. Um, Dre's unbelievable. What, what, he came from Culture Kings? Dre's correct? a beast. Yeah, he was, running a, he was running a chair at Culture Kings right there, there in the CBD. The he was the G there, wasn't oh, he? he was the, he's the only reason you went, man. Culture Kings, you have to put up with, no offense to Culture Kings, but it could be a little hectic in there. And, you know, when he was there, mm. he was the only reason to go for me. But, I remember he's, uh, I read a couple of articles about Dre. Uh, dude, he's, a, he's, he's an there. artist. The guy just actually got involved with Mel Gibson's latest film, so he was cutting hair on set here down in Sydney. So he's doing his thing, working on getting his jet. Go check him out. Definitely. Well, it's good to have someone like him involved. Always. Yeah, man. Cool, man. Well, guys, I know what you've been waiting for now. You're after the interview with John Wayne Parr. So, I'm waiting for it. John Wayne it Parr, let's bring him on. Here it is, guys. The Vision Board Podcast, hosted by Johnny Stofko and Tristan Cannell. The Vision Board Podcast is proud to have on 10 times world Muay Thai champion and runners up on the contender Asia, one of the greatest fighters the world has ever seen. Welcome, John Wayne Parr. Welcome to the show, John. Gentlemen, how's it going? Doing really well, man. Thanks for coming on. Now, just to start, man. Yesterday and today, I've watched your documentary twice, man, and I've had to get the gloves on because I've been that pumped. <laughs> Dude, it's an awesome documentary. Let's begin with your experience in Thailand, man. Tell me a few yeah. stories about that. A few stories. All right. So I, I, I was lucky enough to get sponsored at 19 
uh, my sponsor, Richard Gold, he owns a Thai restaurant here on the Gold Coast called uh, Boonchu. So I had a big hard fight, and he said, um, look, you fought amazing last night. You showed a lot of heart. Uh, I, I'd love to send you to Thailand to learn how to do it from the best. Um, would you be interested? So, oh, yeah, of course. It's like a dream come true. Of course I would. He said, here's the deal. He said, if you can organize your passport, I'll do the rest. All you have to do is... Um, uh, yeah, get your passport. I'll organise somewhere for the for live, train, uh, sleep, eat. Uh, so, oh, this, this is no worries, no worries. So um, I go get my passport, and to Richard's word, we walk down to the news agency. And he he buys me a ticket. But the the deal was, he said, look, I don't want you to to go there for a month or two months. That's a waste of time. Um, if you're going to go, you have to promise me that you're going to stay for six months. So okay, no, no problem, guys. You might have to sleep on the on the floor. You might have to sleep outside. You might have to um, eat and sleep with the dogs. But uh, if you come back within before six months, he said, "Me and you are done. I don't want to know you." So uh, I kept my word. Uh, I stayed for the full six months. I had five fights for five wins. Uh, I think I had three knockouts or four knockouts. And then um, I came back to Australia. It was all. It was all. Uh, I had no idea what I was going to do. I didn't have a job. I'd just been fighting. And then luckily for me, um, the camp rang back Richard up. They said, hey, look, uh, we think John Wayne's got a, a, a fair bit of talent. Do you want to send him back again? We think he's got a big future. So again, Richard sits me down. And he said, look, uh, I don't want to mess around this time. So I said, six months, you got to promise me that you're going to stay for a whole year. So bloody hell, really? So he goes, yep, same deal. Um, long as you promise to stay I make sure that you always got uh, food in, uh, money money in your pocket and um, you'll get looked after so I go for another full year end up having nine fights a year uh, and then I get picked up by the number one promoter so I start fighting in the big stadium start making the front covers of the magazines and um, end up getting uh, voted the strongest foreigner in Thailand for 1997 so yeah it was really cool and then um, from there they just kept continuing and end up staying there four years full uh, four years full time I uh, had approximately 45 fights in Thailand, uh, won two world titles in Bangkok. Uh, and yeah, got to do a lot of first-time stuff for Australia. So first Australian to fight Lumpini, uh, first uh, Australian to fight, uh, uh, sorry, King's Birthday in front of 100,000 people. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, John, yeah, John Wayne, man, um, first off, for anyone listening, our followers, you're like the real life character from Bloodsport. Like, hey. John Cla Claude Van Damme was the actor. Dude, you. I'm not even going to go into it, but yeah, thanks for coming on again. And my question one of the things I was thinking about, you know, when I was watching as a kid, Ramon Deckers, I know you looked up to that type of guy. I once yes. heard, I once heard, um, I think it was Rogan who said he could watch you fight, not even looking at your, your face, but just watching your silhouette, and he'd know it was you. Yeah, who but, do you but, think, yeah. Who do you was this an instinct or was this more of an adoptive style to help um, you know explain your style in the ring? Uh, I I been in Thailand for four years and then when I got back to Australia, I had a few more fights and I started uh, boxing. So I, I retired from Muay Thai. I went to boxing for a year, year and a half, and then I decided to come back to Muay Thai again. And then I think I, I have a. Uh, I, I, I took the best of my Muay Thai, my best of my boxing. I blended it together to make sort of like the the best of both worlds. Um, and then, yeah, so I, I guess not many people sort of do one or the other. Or yeah, what, so have, you, I, I, what have you done in your past? You know, when you were younger, um, that's helped you evolve with your footwork. Was there somebody that you that you mimicked with your footwork? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I did Taekwondo when I was. Uh, 11 for about a year and a half, two years, and then I went to, to Muay Thai when I was 13, and then, yeah, like I said, I, I boxed for a little bit for a, a year or so. I ended up having 13 pro boxing fights, uh, 10 wins, 10 knockouts. Yeah, so, I saw that you fought Saki Obiki, you fought Nader Hamden, so in that year, yes. you, you, you took some, some of the best guys on in Australia. Yeah, yeah, I sort of got chucked under the bus a little bit. Yeah, Bika, um, Bika has bricks in his fist. You went the whole distance with that guy. What was yeah. that like? Uh, everyone was feared. No one wanted to fight him. And then I, uh, he, I, I was, I won the Australian title, and then I got, I, I lost it to Ian McLeod, and then not long later, Sikki Abika beat Ian for it. So then, um, I, I, I came, I, I went to uh, America for a little bit, and I came back to Australia, and I thought, oh, to to fill in the gaps in between my Muay Thai fights, I might take a boxing fight here and there, here and there, uh, and then I, my first boxing fight. 
uh, I had a first round knockout against uh, Mike Cope, and then I had another Muay Thai fight, and then the opportunity came, hey, do you want to fight Sidney Abdika? Um, no one wants to fight him, so I'll yeah, fight him, no worries. I was trying to get my belt back. Yeah. And then, um, and then, um, yeah, he, he was just a um, different level. He was, he was, because I, because I wasn't dedicated to boxing, I didn't have the same footwork as I was if I was fighting boxing the whole time. Uh, and then after the, after three rounds, I sort of went back into automatic mode where my body weight shifted into the Muay Thai stance and my guard was a little bit off and uh, there wasn't as much head movement as I should have been. And Sigo just, um, used me as a, as a punching bag. So, but I was happy to make the 12 rounds. So he was, a. Uh, but I tell you what, though, after 12 rounds, uh, it was the first time in my whole career where my brain went numb for about two or three hours. People were coming to me in the in the change room and they were talking to me, and everything seemed like they were talking an alien. I couldn't understand what they were saying. And then about about three hours later, um, all of a sudden I had clarity, and then uh, English started making sense again. It's like, oh, and that, that's when I decided, oh, no more boxing. I, I don't want to have brain damage. I, I don't want to be in that world ever again. I'll just keep sick to my time. Yeah, you're very, the way you fight, the way you carry yourself, the way you give interviews, how you carry yourself as a man is very honorable. I know you have a little one, um, le you know, l learning to fight or for anyone out there who has kids. In terms of role models, the way Rosie handles herself and the way home handles herself, I know you were cage side to that thing, we, um, you, you know, watching it on social media and everything, you were right there. What's your yep. opinion on that for the younger people listening, the better way, I guess, to go about being a champion? Uh, it's uh, with with Rousey and uh, Holly. It's it's complete. It's it's like rock and wrestling. Um, it, as much as everyone loves the good guy, you got to have the bad guy. Yeah. So so and and Rousey was such a good bad guy. Um, it wasn't until she lost that everyone go, oh yeah, she, what a she was a bitch. But at the same time, when she was winning, she was uh, she, everyone loved her, and uh, yeah, I, I still think she's a legend. Yeah. But at the same time, when you're looking back in all those times, she didn't shake her opponent's hands, or or when she went crazy at the weigh-in, it's like, what are you doing? Just 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 be cool. It's just a fight. Yeah, you don't have to to, to lose the, lose the plot. It's just uh, it's just it's just business. Yeah. So yeah, uh, as as role models, I I think it's better to for myself because I'm 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 the smiley happy fella. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I I I don't I don't need to do the Conor McGregor and stuff to to talk crap to try and sell fights. I let my fists do the talking. But um, at the same time, look where he is now. He's had 20 fights. He's making $3 million a fight. I'm the good guy. And I am had 123 fights. And I'm lucky to make this week's rent. Well, I actually, I actually wanted to touch base on that. Because in, in the fight world, in the fight community, people have known you for a long, long time. But what I'm starting to notice, too, in the last few years is... You're starting to hit pop culture more in, in America. You, you know, I see you're in the Rogan Circle. You've been on the podcast a few times. And then you're at the events. What's that been like later on? Because it's later on in, in your fight career in sort of the evolution of the, of the legend. Hey, um, yeah, it's really cool. Uh, I, what happened, um, a lot of people inundated Joe on uh, Twitter. Hey, you got to get John Wayne on your podcast. Got to get John Wayne on, and then one day, randomly, he's come out and he and he said, "Hey, look, if John Wayne's ever in America, there's an open invitation to come on my show." Wow. And it's like, oh, oh shit, <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, so I wrote him a message saying, "Oh, if if um, if I book a ticket, are you good to take up your word?" He goes, "Yeah, for sure, 100 percent." So I, I threw a date at him. He said, "Yep, I'm free that weekend. Let's let's do it." So um, yeah, I jumped on the plane. Um, uh, I arrived in the airport, and I, I think I arrived on the Friday. I might have been. I arrived on the s Friday. I think the podcast was going to be on the Saturday, or, or vice versa. So I turned my phone on, and um, as I turned my phone, there's a, there's a message from Joe saying, "Hey, look, we're doing the fight campaign tonight. Do you want to come on the podcast tonight and tomorrow?" That's like, uh, sure. Yeah. So we jump straight on the taxi, and then I uh, get to the podcast, and there's Eddie Bravo and uh, Brent, Brendan Sh Shaw. And uh, Brian Callen, and it's like, this is, yeah, just pinching myself. The guy had jet lag, and then um, the, the room sounded a little bit funny. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. And then the next day, the next day I went back again. I felt a bit more comfortable because I'd already been there once before. And then um, then we did the proper podcast. And then, yeah, this year again, the same thing. I went to have the fight online fight, and then Joe said, oh, since you're here, you want to jump in the podcast again? So this time was even better again because I was even more relaxed and we could just uh, bounce off each other. And because we had already interacted before and uh, we did some training at his gym, um, it was it was even more fun again. So yeah, he's he's the coolest guy. Yeah, he's, he's such. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Now, 
John, you're also a huge fan of John Claude Van Damme and the kickboxing boxer movies, man. They named him Nooksu Cow in the movie. What did the yeah. show name you, man? Uh, they called me John Will, uh, which uh, uh, also the Jinjo Mahagan, which means the dangerous kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so uh, I got learnt very early that Wayne means bust. So um, they couldn't call me Wayne. So they said, "Oh, we need to call you something for your fight name." Um, what about what about John Wayne? John Wayne's like the most famous cowboy, easy for people to remember. Uh, and that got changed to John Well. So for the next four years, um, ever, hey Well, Well, hey John Well. <laughs> so yeah, and then when when they said you want to, we're going to start calling you John Wayne. I'm thinking, oh, that's so shit. <laughs> that's the dumbest <laughs> name. That's the that's the dumbest name ever. Uh, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, screw it. Why I'm in Thailand, no one's going to know. Um, I'll just use that when I get back to Australia. I'll go back being um, something hardcore like uh, Wayne, the Punisher, Pa, or something, something tough. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, somehow or other, got, I got famous and the John Wayne stuck. So, and now it's just now I just introduce myself as John Wayne to everyone that meets me. It's fun too because uh, when people come up and say g'day, g'day, John, g'day, John. So it's not till they about two or three weeks later after knowing someone that I say, hey, look. We've been friends now for a couple of weeks now. I think it's a good time to tell you that my name's really Wayne. So, <laughs> has, has your parents ever slipped like John instead of Wayne before? Oh, yeah. My, my dad used to do it all the time. He used to introduce me as, as John Wayne. And then he shakes. He said, damn it. Your name's Wayne, not John. I keep doing it by mistake. That, that, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a strong name. Regard, John Wayne Parr, JWP. That's a beast of a name. Um, I want to chat a little bit about. Uh, I, I think it's. I think it's phenomenal, and, and it's rare about the lack of injuries. I know you've had, you know, thousands of stitches. <laughs> you know, with all the elbows being thrown and knees. But having a career such as you know, highly you know, renowned as yours in such a brutal sport, what do you attribute that to? Of never having that major knee, never ankle, things like that. Uh, just uh, good genetics. Just blessed, lucky. Uh, there's, there's nothing I can put it down to because I, I, I own a gym and I, and I train. Uh, I've had hundreds of fighters come through my, my, uh, my premises and then uh, I've seen guys with all those skills in the world and their shoulder will pop or their knee will pop or they get broken ribs or, or work commitments or the misses or the kids and they have to retire for one reason or another. And uh, for some reason, uh, all my planets have aligned that will let me have a, an amazing career and, I, and I'm still going to this day, so no idea, I'm just lucky. I like yeah. I like what you just said there. I know I know that you train at once um, Saint Pierre, and the way he adopts his his way of looking the, the fight game. He has a quote of saying, "My adversary completes me. To disrespect him is to disrespect myself." What was it like training with a guy like GSP? Yeah, it was cool. It was uh, when I when I arrived in Montreal. Uh, George picked me up from the hotel uh, from the airport. And then uh, it was so surreal. And then uh, we, he took me to the hotel. And he goes, oh, this is the same hotel that I like to keep Freddie Roach and all my other uh, boxing sparring partners. I'm thinking, oh, this is uh, this is a dream. Yeah. And then uh, and then uh, just walking the streets or going to a restaurant or going just the, the, I've never seen anyone get inundated so much to ask for photos and signatures and handshakes and. Uh, he, he can't walk down the street. He can't walk uh, 200 meters down the street without getting stopped 50, 100 times, um, and, which I thought was really cool for the first couple of days. But then after you be with him for like a week or two, you realize, hey, this isn't healthy because it doesn't turn off. It doesn't matter if it's morning, night, lunchtime. Um, even when he goes to the toilet, the people wait outside his cubicle for him to come out after he's done number twos <laughs> to, try and shake, to try and shake his hand and stuff. It's just... Uh, He's got no privacy. It'd send you crazy, for sure. Are you doing any type of, uh, you know, being in your late 30s, still being <clears throat> one of the most feared guys on the planet, um, the last couple of years, because of your boy Rogan, I've been involved in the tank. I float every Sunday. I'm a big fan of acupuncture, massage, basically maintenance for our body. Are you doing yep. any types of um, naturopathic ways of, you know, assisting your body? Hey, funny you should mention, uh, we just had the flotation tank. Uh, place Freedom Float uh, just near my gym. They opened up about a month ago, and they've been, invited me down. And I've, I've had about three or four floats so far, and it's uh, it's so cool. Yeah, how are you? So, uh, in, in, when you're floating now, do you where do you put your arms at? Are you going over over the top of your head, like uh, open your chest uh, up? I'm I'm doing Snow Angel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, pretty. How do you I'm like still it? Ad, I'm still adjusting. I, the whole idea of not being out of sync is uh, it's still blows my mind 
Um, so it's getting it's getting better though. I, I, I drift down in and out of consciousness and um, go to different places. Uh, yeah, do you find yeah. that when you get out of the tank? Because what happens with me, I float, there's a place in Bondi, <clears throat> and, and after an hour in the tank, I walk into the Bondi Manus and it's almost like, uh, I want to go back in the tank. Like, <laughs> has that happened to you? It's like, shit, I want to go back. This place is chaos. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it's pretty cool, but yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, just adjusting to it. It's going to be it's definitely a way of uh, meditating and, and trying to focus on different combinations. And uh, when I put it online that I'd been to the tank, a, a, a lot of people are hitting me up and saying, hey, try and concentrate on this next time you go in or, or think about certain different things that of your fight game to try and enhance that. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's I'll send you my e a... I, wrote, I wrote an e-book, like an introductory guide for people who are floating. But, yeah, there's, like, little tips you can do to detach yourself from all that. But that's cool, man. Yep. Yeah, that was fun. Awesome, man. Just back to GSP, man. Um, just read a few things that when you went, went over to spa with him, um, in terms of uh, stand-up game, you actually qu kind of dominated him. Is that true? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. The humble John Wayne. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The first time we sparred, the first I, I wasn't with him the first time. I, I happened to be in Canada for seminars, and uh, I'd done seven seminars in seven days, and I had, I had uh, two days left before I was heading back to Australia. And then the, the, the gentleman that brought me over, he's like, "Hey, look, you got a bit of time to kill. Would you like to go to Montreal and meet George?" It's like, "Yeah, that'd be amazing." So he made a phone call to Faraz, and he said, "Yeah, well, funny enough." Uh, uh, Tuesday's uh, Muay Thai sparring day. If if John wants to come down and, and hang out, he's more than welcome to jump in for some rounds. It's like holy shit, yeah, for sure, that's mad. So we were right there on the Monday. That um, Fraz puts us up in a hotel. Uh, I get to meet all the boys on, on the Monday evening, and then um, as I'm about to walk out of the gym, Fraz goes, "Oh, just want to let you know, every single person in the gym shitting themselves." I say, like, "Why?" He goes, "Oh, because you're you're John Wayne." I was like, what? They know who I am. He goes, oh, don't, don't worry. I've told every single person. So uh, the next day comes. I bring my gloves and shin pads. Uh, the boys are warming up. It's like, okay, time to, time to spar. Okay, uh, George, you go with John Wayne. I was like, holy crap. This is this is my chance to... Um, so, yeah, I was, I was so nervous. And then I, I walked over to George and in a squeaky little voice, oh, George, it's so nice to meet you. Oh, God, this is such an honor for me. I can't believe it. And then... Um, we touched gloves and the round started, and then after about 15 seconds in, I'm thinking, hang on a second, where's this killer that I've seen on TV all these times? And then uh, I started landing kicks and started blocking his punches and coming back with counters. And at one stage, I parried his jab and I threw a head kick and, and I, I planted my shin across his neck and just left it there for about 10 seconds, uh, enough time for the whole gym to stop and, 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 and watch me put my shin across his neck and just leave it there like a, uh, like, like a, like, like a scene out of Van Damme. Posterized him. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, and then after the spa, George was like, oh, thank you so much. Um, if that was anyone else in the world, they would have taken me out to, to, as their claim for fame, but uh, you were polite enough to just leave it there. So, hey, don't worry about it. It's just, um, just what I do. Yeah, that... Uh, uh, Go so on. yeah, and then and then uh, about I, I took some photos with him. We said goodbye. I was told him I was great to meet him. And then a month later, Faraz rang me back saying, "Hey, look, George's got his fight coming up with um, Johnny Hendricks. He wanted to know if you'd like to come back and train him personally for two weeks." So I was like, "Oh, bloody hell!" So that's that's how that one came about. Just from that one spa, it was enough to sort of influence him to let me come back and train him. Wow! And how long did you end up training him for? Uh, just just the two weeks. But the only problem was um, he brought me out. There was 14 weeks to go before his fight with Henriks, and I, I had him moving perfectly. He was fighting a southpaw, so we I made a, a good game plan. Uh, I did everything to counter a, a southpaw mo movements. Every time we sparred, I, I sparred like Johnny, so he'd get used to the, the crazy um, southpaw style and, and, and Johnny's crazy left hand. And then by the time I went back to Australia, I think George fell back into his old ways of training, and then he when I went when across the fight, um, he sort of fought the wrong game plan. He, he was moving into Johnny's left hand instead of moving away. Uh, yeah, I, even though I, I believe he won, um, but uh, he, he could have won a lot easier and not take as much punishment as he did the day that, that he did fight him. Yeah, he ended up winning a, uh, he won a split there. He, he did, he took a yeah. lot more, he took a lot yeah. more headshots yeah. than he normally did. His yeah, movement, I, 
Yeah, he I thought uh, going into the fifth round, it was up to the fifth round who was going to take it. It was, it was two apiece, and the fifth round was going to claim it, and, and George just scrapped in just to take it. But yeah. Yeah, he's so, and his face was all banged up, but definitely he could have done it a lot easier. Yeah, while we're here, who do you, who do you like? Uh, who do you like, Condit or Lawler? Condit. Yeah, he's a savage, isn't he? Yeah, even George said um, Condit was his yeah. hardest fight. Yeah, Lawler. Watching him since it, you got to cheer for a guy, you know, who, who gets kid, you know, loses it, comes back, overcomes adversity. Um, yeah. In terms of, I read a lot about fighters or you know writers, musicians talking about a flow state. Ali talks about when he was younger and fought Cleveland Williams, and he doesn't even remember the fight at all. Was there ever a moment? Was there ever a moment in your career where you were just so dominant, you were so tuned in that um, you weren't in control of what was going on? Uh, yeah, when I fought uh, Michael Zambidis, um, the this, this second time I beat him on points over five rounds. And then, yeah, just one of those days where every, everything just clicked. It was just, um, yeah, just perfect. I wanted to talk about that, actually, because that was a massive trilogy that you had with Zambidis. Was it personal? Like, it just looked like when you knocked him out in that last one that um, you did. You both had something, something there that you just didn't like each other. Yeah, yeah, we don't like each other. Yeah, <laughs> the... Um, the <laughs> The, the first time the first time I'd been in Thailand a long time, and while I was away, um, Zambini's crept into the scene, and he became the, the household name of all of Australia. He was fighting regularly on Fox Sports. I think he had something like 16 fights in Australia or something, all undefeated, all majority knockouts. Um, he was a household name, and I, I'd done all this stuff in Thailand, but no one knew who I was in Australia. So, so he was the man I had to beat to try and become somebody. So when we when we fought, we fought on an eight-man tournament, and we had the press conference prior to that. And then um, I met Zambidis for the first time. I said, "Oh, look, uh, I think I think we're we're both going to win, and we're going to meet into the final." And for that, he sort of smiled at me. Yes, yes, yes. And he said, "And then when we fight in the final, he said, I'm going to knock you out." And from that, his his face just changed. And then uh, I, I was pretty arrogant too. I was I was pretty I was young and obnoxious, and um, I wanted something to prove. And from that moment on, well, uh, I guess we didn't like each other very much. And then every time we see each other, he sort of um, mad dog me, and I'd mad dog him. And then the, the last time that we fought, when the referee brought us together, he leaned into my ear as the referee was telling instructions. He said, "Tonight, I'm going to kill you." <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was like a scene out of Rocky. Yeah. So, so, uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, the next thing I wanted to uh, touch base with was so right now you've seen a lot of guys like Adu Portal, Movement Coach. He helped Connor out, and then you have uh, Kirsten out of LA doing you know work with Rafael Dos Anjos. A lot of that type of training is like more plyometric body weight movements. In your like, what, what's in your back pocket? Are you, have you stuck to the same that you've always been doing, or are you watching yourself evolve too? Uh, after watching the UFC uh, and all the the road to road to the titles and everything else, so um, I, I started to incorporate a lot of weight training into my game. Um, but but then after about two years, I decided I, I went back to Thailand for a big fight, and I, I watched the Thais. And I noticed all the Thais do is is Thai training. They don't do weights. They don't do anything besides run pads. Spar, grapple. Um, so I thought when I got back to Australia, I thought, oh, I'm just going to keep it simple. And sp instead of spending um, hours uh, lifting weights, I just spend that more. I just spend that time um, working on my technique to try and uh, perfect my technique more. So same with the UFC guys. They they throw hammers around all day and throw the ropes and tw they throw the tires. But the, then you watch them fight and they can't throw a straight jab. Yeah. So yeah, I'd rather I'd rather have a perfect style instead of big muscles. Yeah, that's that's interesting. We had a guy, we had Fen Jeff Fennick on um, a, co a couple weeks ago, and he was talking about that too, about not getting too fancy away from you know sticking to your guns and what works in terms of training. Yes. Yeah, definitely. What was your nutrition like? Like, have you seen you know training in America, training in Thailand, training in Australia? What's the biggest thing that you you notice with the nutrition difference of the countries? Uh, yeah, the Thais. Um, so Thai food's Thai food. So whether it be uh, breakfast or dinner, it's still rice, it's still meat, it's still vegetables. Uh, there's there's no different. It's still hot, so you, you're having breakfast and you're having chilies. So uh, and it, but the, the good thing about Thai food, everything's fresh. Um, they buy it off off the back of a truck every single day. Whereas you come back to Australia and everything's canned and everything's processed. Yeah. Um, everything has preservatives. Uh, everything's full of sugar. So. Uh, yeah, even though even though Thai food's Thai food, I, I felt healthier 
in, inside than I did when I was eating Western food. So, um, yeah, and now, now that I'm getting older too, I'm, I'm a bit more cautious about uh, dropping my weight over a period of time instead of trying to cut it all in, in one week, which was just ludicrous. Yeah, yeah what's your opinion on that? Uh, I know the UFC just changed the rules. Uh, no more, uh, you know, using the IV to help with the weight cut and put the weight back on. Uh, is that yeah. a good? Is that a good move for these fighters? Yeah, it's it's going to be tough. Um, I I like using the IV uh, after every weigh-in because I, I'm losing crazy. Uh, I was losing crazy amounts of weight, but uh, I, I don't think it's going to be as bad. Actually, another organization called One FC they've just brought out a statement uh, about a week ago saying they're going to bring out a new policy where all fighters must be walk around weight. Um, they're going to be checking fighters three weeks out, two weeks out, five days out, three days out. Wow. Um, I, I have no idea how they're going to implement the the new rule, but you're not allowed to be more than like only a, a, a couple of kilos off, off your uh, fight weight. Uh, and I think they're going to weigh you straight after your fight as well. So it's just, yeah, I, I think all, all their champions are going to have to relinquish their belts because no, no, no one's going to be able to maintain. In that weight um, class. Oh, no way, impossible. I once heard George, uh, I once heard GSP talk about if he was if he was in charge of the UFC, if he was in charge of mixed martial arts, the most pure way to fight would be with no gloves. Because he said if you don't have gloves on, that would like take away those haymakers and it would force the fighters to be more precise and exact so they don't break their hands. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, my hands are pretty fragile. Um, I've heard him a few times. I, I definitely would rather have. Um, at least a minimum of MMA gloves. Um, even a boxing glove sometimes, if you punch wrong, you can break your wrists and break your, break your knuckles. So, yeah, the whole idea of punching skull with bare hands, it's, um, yeah, pretty frightening. Awesome, so, yeah, yeah, yeah also, not a good idea. You also fought in um, the first cage Muay Thai event in Australia in 2012, yeah? Yes, yeah, that was my idea. What was the difference, <laughs> like, obviously, between the two gloves? Like, oh, you were just talking about your hands and things like that. Um, how'd you go in, in the cage, man? Yeah, the uh, one, one, one. I would, I've been a really massive fan of UFC. I've always wanted to fight in the in the cage. Um, growing up as a as a as a small boy, the ultimate arena was when Hulk Hogan would fight someone in the cage. And then when UFC started, it's like, oh, this is just a, 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 a to continue on from there. Um, but I have no jujitsu, so I thought, like, well, how can I fight in the cage but not have to learn jujitsu? Oh, why don't I just invent my own show? Um, we, I do promotions anyway, so all I have to do is hire a cage instead of a ring. So, so we we did that, and then um, started training in the little gloves, and then it just it was a whole new playing field. Uh, you're so used to wearing 16s or, or 10 outs on the pads, and then when you put the little MMA gloves on, you, you can't hit the same spot on the pad twice. It's like uh, you have to be laser guided to try and hit the the same target. It's so hard, and then even with your defence, all of a sudden with boxing gloves on, you can close your hands and you don't get hit. Whereas MMA gloves on, you have all these gaps all of a sudden where your jaw is exposed more. So, and because they are so small too, there's a big chance that you're going to get knocked out if you stay in the pocket for too long. So you rely on a lot more footwork, uh, just not not get hit, um, and more calculated. So it definitely you definitely need your A game every time you step into the cage. Otherwise, there's a good possibility if you don't get knocked out, you're going to get extremely hurt anyway. Yeah. So, so has Dana has Dana White or uh, Silva like behind closed doors? kind of whispered in your ear offering you a fight against someone has this happened oh no they they want me to have a ground game they know who i am yeah and they they know my interest in in the sport and they know that i'm a massive fan but in, until i prove myself with a few mma fights even with uh the ultimate fighter when they did the australia versus canada yeah um uh, i threw my name in the, in the mix and they said oh i need at least two or three mma fights to prove that i'm not just going to get taken down and and, and uh, ragdolled on the floor Really, I saw your name pop up in some blogs about uh, fight being the guy to fight the WWF guy. Um, yeah, <laughs> can you imagine, yeah. dude? Yeah. That kid, I think you that guy would get worked. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> I, that'd I be funny. That. <laughs> it, 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 apparently, he's got a really good ground game, though. So there's a good chance he'd probably take me down and, and play. He'd have uh, to get past those elbows and knees, though, and, and that that overhand, man. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, I'd definitely try and hurt him if he yeah. did try to shoot me. That's what I'm but, um, it, it'd be it, a massive way of getting the name out there because he's got like something to mean and something followers on Twitter alone. So he's, he's a superstar. It, it's crazy to think too. It, I think Dana. So 
I've gone to, I've been in Australia for two years, and I've gone to all the, the UFC events, but it wasn't until Melbourne 193 when it hit me and I realized how smart Dana White and the UFC is in terms of the production, even from like calling the fighters out and, the, and um, Buffer announcing them, it does have a WWF feel to it. Oh yeah, yeah. That, I think that they've even come out and said in, in uh, multiple interviews they they know that they only they they've got to ride the bubble for as long as it takes before it pops. Um, everything goes through phases, and uh, UFC is just another phase. So why why the interest is high? Um, and look what they're charging for tickets. They oh. um, their tickets are crazy, like one fifty, two hundred, three hundred bucks, and you and you feel like you're two kilometers away from the cage, and they're getting away with it. People are paying their tickets. Yeah, the energy and man, the energy at Eddie Head Stadium was crazy when uh, yeah. even during the Joanna fight. I know you were, we were in a, I think we were in like the seventh row. You guys were closer, but um, m my opinion on uh, on that. Have you fought? You said you fought in front of a hundred thousand people before. Yeah, four times. What did that feel like? Uh, the, the the first time, uh, my my knees went weak. Uh, actually, almost sort of half. Collapse. <laughs> uh, I got up on the ring and I looked out and there was nothing but an ocean of hits. And then once, um, yeah, I sort of burnt myself out too. I went too hard too early in the in the first opening rounds and I guessed in the fourth and fifth. But the second time I did it, I, I told myself, not, I've got to make sure that I, I go out there and enjoy it. I'm not going to make the same mistake I did the first time. So I got out, I took a big breath, I took a look at the crowd and I just thought to myself, how amazing is this opportunity? And then I went and had the greatest fight ever, and, uh, beating my tie every beating the tie around. I broke his arm, broke his nose. Um, yeah, and they then uh, the they didn't send you to prison either, did they? No. So the next time I did it, the third time I did it, um, I got out to the ring. And I've overlooked the crowd, and I'm thinking, oh, geez, I could squeeze in another two or three hundred people at the back there. It's a bit quiet tonight. There's only like ninety nine thousand seven hundred people here tonight. <laughs> That's crazy. Hey, I saw you tweeted. Uh, th th this is off the pace, but. You met you met your wife in Vegas. Yes. Now is she is she American? Yes, she's from uh, Victorville in uh, California. Oh, Victorville. That's the yeah on the way to Vegas. On the way to Vegas. So was, yeah. it, was, was it the accent or what was it? Uh, yeah, she was uh, the most famous female Muay Thai fighter in America when we first met. Oh, so wow. she so she was a regular on ESPN. Um, she was a super fight on all the K1 shows in Vegas. She was fighting at the Bellagio and. Uh, uh, yeah, she and plus she's not bad looking either. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the so, genetics in that household are uh, top of the line. And you wouldn't want to break yeah, into that household. So, right? Yeah, someone ever tried breaking into the par home? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I got, I got offered a, a, a opportunity to, to teach and fight at a Vegas, and then Angie was training and fighting at a Vegas too. So we, we hooked up, and then yeah, and then we got three little kids, and uh, I got deported. Um, I overstayed my visa two days. I came back to Australia and I went to go back into America and they said, no, you overstayed your visa two days. We're sending you back home. They told me not to come back for five years. So, so, so Angie jumped on a plane. She sold up all her belongings. Uh, had enough money for a plane ticket. She got to Australia. And then we've been here for the last 13 years and three kids later and a successful gym. And we are, now I've, I've managed to save up all my prize money. I've, I've bought my house. I've bought my gym. Um, yeah, we're kicking ass. Yeah, man, you're just getting started too. Like there, the legend of John Wayne Park goes way beyond <laughs> that ring. All right, no, thank you. Yeah, man, dude. Just back to your um, just fighting career. Uh, when you went to Singapore to fight on the Contender, what was that experience yep. like? Because it looked like you were coasting through the prelim, and then you got to the final. And the gentleman's name—he just looked like a rock. He looked like a Asian version of Ivan, Ivan Drago. He was just yeah. Yeah, Yotsingway. Yotsingway was the beast. Is he the most fierce opponent you, you had over your career? Uh, definitely. I fought him three times. So I fought him before the show, and then he knocked me down with a head kick in the second round the first time, and then uh, I, I, I pretty much blacked out. But I finished the, the fight. I went all five rounds with him. Uh, but I can't remember what happened after the lockdown. And then we, we, we got again on the show, and we, we became buddies because we lived together for eight weeks straight, side by side. Uh, and then when I fought him, um, so what happened was we, we shot 14 episodes and then there was a, a six month break between the the the, the, the semi main and the, the main because they, they needed to edit the show then they had to telecast it and then then they had a live final so and then during that six months uh, Angie got pregnant she was about to have that baby and then uh, my dad had contracted uh, pancreas cancer so all in between so I was almost losing my dad and then he got really sick and I started 
uh, wasn't focusing on training as much as I was because, yeah, like I said before, sometimes life gets really busy. And then um, I, I got to uh, I got to San Diego. Uh, sorry, I was uh, Singapore a few weeks uh, before the. Uh, sorry, a few days before the final, and I was still ten kilos over. Uh, so I had to try and kill myself in trying to lose all the weight. And then when I fought, he was he was ready. Uh, it was one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the winner. So um, there was no way no one he was going to let some Westerner beat him up. And then um, yeah, it was probably the hardest fight of my life that 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 fight. So he kept dropping me, but because uh, my dad was sick too, there was no way known that I was going to let him uh, a bit knock me out anyway. So as long as I finished the fight on my feet, I was happy. Yeah, it was a, and then you said that you, you won the last, the last match, didn't you? Yeah, we, we rematched about uh, two or three years later in, in Melbourne. Uh, it, it was very close. Uh, I, I tell people this all the time. If the fight was in Thailand, um, they have a different scoring system. He probably would have won. But because it was in Melbourne, uh, they, they score the hands a lot more than the legs. So I think just by pure fluke that uh, I was lucky enough to, to pick up the victory. And uh, uh, it's still my, my, my biggest win to, to 123 fights in my career. That was my number one uh, scalp. Wow. Cool, man. So, Joe, we like telling stories around here. And if, you could, if you're around a campfire and your family's around, you're thinking of all your travels, all the guys you fought, all the guys you've met and sparred with, what would the story yeah. pop up, like a funny one? A uh, funny one? Yeah, let's hear some. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, jeez. No what filter. Let's hear what it. What do we got? What do we got? Jeez. <laughs> uh, oh, what's a funny one? What's a funny one? Jeez, uh, you put me on the spot. Uh, what do we got? Think Vegas. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, all you yeah. got to do is think yeah. Vegas. Yeah. So probably one of the, the highlight of my career is um, I, I went to Thailand uh, after I moved back to Australia, I went to Thailand to fight in an eight-man tournament. Uh, I had three fights in two hours, been, been in three three guys. Uh, I, I beat all three. I won a, a world title, a million baht, which is about 35,000 Australian, and a, and a trophy from the Prime Minister of Thailand. Uh, and then two weeks later, I had a fight in Italy. So I, I kept training in Thailand. I flew to Italy. I, I won that fight as well. I flew back to Thailand to pick up all my belongings. And now I had a, a, one of those big, fake, a million but novelty checks. Um, I had two massive um, uh, uh, title uh, uh, trophies, and then I had a world title around my shoulder. So I'm walking through the airport, and I've got all this bling <laughs> coming through. And then as soon as I arrive back in Australia, uh, I get a phone call from a, a Japanese manager saying, hey, do you want to fight in Tokyo in 10 days? We've had a late pull out, and we need uh, someone to fill the spot. Um, so I've, I've taken the fight. I've jumped on the plane a week later. I've ended up um, fighting an American gentleman, Dwayne Ludwig. Oh. Um, I've, knocked, I've knocked him down three times, and I've, I've won the fight on points. So I ended up having uh, five fights in four weeks in three countries and, and one, or, one or five. So that was probably my, my greatest month ever. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Awesome, man. Now, you've got your gym down in Gold Coast, man. Is it, is it Bon Chu or Bon Chi is pronounced? Uh, bon Chu. Bon Chu. It means blessed by the gods in Thai. Awesome. So, yeah, it's my sponsor's restaurant, and to say thank you to him for looking after me. I've, I've named the gym after his shop, so, yeah, it's, and it's very deep and meaningful, too, to be blessed by the guys. Ever since he's looked after me, I feel like I've definitely been blessed by something a lot stronger than the human. Mate. So, yeah. Where can, the yeah. People, where can the people find it, man? Uh, it's in Burley Heads. Uh, it's on Courtham Drive. Uh I'm, I, I teach majority of the classes, so it's not one of those gyms where someone owns it and then someone else teaches. I'm, I'm there every morning, every night teaching. If I'm not training, I'm teaching. Uh, I do PTs. Um, I hold them pads. So it's good fun. I, I, I like being amongst it. Awesome, man. Next time in Jody, you have to come hit you up, man. Oh, definitely. Come and say good day. Come and pick up my cage. Yeah, man. It's pretty cool. Hey, <laughs> hey John, for, for our uh, listeners and followers who don't know where to find you online, how could, how could people... Uh, you know, follow your, your journey. If, if you like Instagram, uh, John Wayne Pa, I've, I've, uh, I like to put up funny stuff to try and uh, make people giggle. Yeah, yeah, some, 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 now, some, right? Sometimes it's rated R, sometimes it's uh, hit and miss with the jokes, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, it's very cool. And then I have an athlete page on Facebook, uh, John Wayne Pa again. So I'm just lucky enough to crack 120,000 people, which is I'm pretty excited about. I, I feel like I'm set, set, 
semi celebrity after Joe Rogan's helped put my name out there. So it's yeah, since, man. I love the since, I love the uh, Borat Mankini you had on. <laughs> <laughs> was that, uh, that, was, that was rough. Was that a, it was yeah. a Christmas party? Was it Christmas yeah, party? The, the the Jim Christmas party breakup. So <laughs> I put the, I put this thing on, and then she asked me, "Hey, come and take a photo." So we went to a photo, and I I looked down. And I've noticed that it wasn't a very secure package, and I had little lumps and bumps and pieces of meat hanging out either side of the. It's like, oh. <laughs> 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 John, yeah. John, John Wayne Park, thank you so much for coming on. We wish you the best for 2016, and hopefully we'll get you on again, man. Hey, awesome, love to. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Thanks a lot, man. No worries, man. We'll speak soon. Hey, beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, John. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. John Wayne Parr, locked and loaded. Yeah, so I was watching that. I was watching D VHSs of John Wayne Parr's fights in like the late 90s when we were like 15, 16. I remember because I was the first time I saw him was actually on the reality show, The, the Contender. So that was back in 2007. And then I remember looking him up on things like YouTube, the internet, yeah. just following his career from there. And just to speak to him now is awesome. But just his style, I still can't believe he's fighting at 39 because that, that style he's got... Is it's just one way traffic. You're only going forward. It's man. If you like action packed fights, if you like a guy who never yeah retreats, um, the samurai had a saying called Don Tatsu, and Don Tatsu means um, always moving forward. Yeah. It's why they didn't wear back armor because they never retreated. That is a perfect um, way of explaining how John John Wayne Parr fights. Yeah, definitely. He's like the Bernard Hopkins of Muay Thai, really. But um, yeah, what a what a gentleman, and it was great to have him on. But uh, I just like like we'll be, like. Episode four, we talked about troubles. You know, yeah. he left his his home. I think he was nineteen years old when he left the Gold Coast for, for yeah. Thailand. Like he went with no one. He, you know, he just took a chance and backed his abilities. So. I, I think it's the crazy thing too with um, the evolution of social media is to watch him evolve because now he's in you know he's in the Joe Rogan circle. So all of Roganites, you know, to now know about John Wayne Park. And even though his career, you know, he's in the twilight of his career. The comment I made earlier, the guy is probably not even close to as famous as he will be yeah. and just from you know appearances people talking about him what he has to offer his story and yeah the guy's really a stand up class act too but it's good to see him getting the recognition now and That's I think right. down the track he'll become a wonderful coach which already is I think he'll get recognition for that his media circle is getting bigger and bigger I think you wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me to see a media career for John Wayne Parr as well oh yeah the, the coach I think he so I once he gave an interview about fighting until the day he died talking about if it was up to him he loves fighting so much that's how he would go on, go out he doesn't want to retire he does bring a very interesting perspective on life and it's good to see him open up about like you know his his wars with Zambitis you know all the stuff that he done with Thailand and um, yeah, five. What was it? Five victories in four weeks in four different countries, something along those lines. Just think about that. When he was telling that story, I was thinking about putting myself in his shoes. And I hate the thing about traveling that that I hate is going through customs. Yeah. So I, the first thing I think of are those big trophies he's carrying around, and then you have to do custom after custom. But in his head, all he cares about is fighting. So none of that even. All he sees is fighting. So his world is is you know, a different world than we see. It's pretty yeah. interesting. In the first 10 episodes, we've talked a lot about information sharing. And you don't get much better than John Wayne Parr. He's on the floor every day coaching, taking classes, giving back to the people. Like, that's what we're about. If you're out there, you've got some information, don't just keep it secret. Share it with the world, make it a better place, and, you know. Yeah, I like the idea. Sharing knowledge, yeah. sharing knowledge is, uh, is key for um, everybody's evolution. There are people you might meet that might just keep it to themselves, but those people you don't want to be around anyway. You want to be around those people saying, hey, this worked for me, do it this, this, and this. You don't have to do it this exact way, but if you could pick one little thing up that I could help you with and apply it to what you need to do, I think that's important. Definitely. But we'll definitely have John Wayne Park back in 2016. The man's an absolute legend, but guys, if you can just support us by just hitting that subscribe button on iTunes, also just leaving us a review, we'd love to hear what you think about all the interviews that we're doing. If you want other guests, some of your heroes that you want might be on, we'll reach out to them, try to get them on for you. Actually, we will get them on for you. There's no such thing yeah, to try. Yeah, tag us too, though, on like our Facebooks, our Instagram, the Fit Coach, Tristan Canal Fitness. And that way, you know, you can stay in the loop, check our newsletters out, our websites, www.therealfitcoach.com.
and www.tristancanalfitness.com. Just remember the Q&A section as well. Send any of the questions or answers. You might even just have just a random question you might want to ask someone that's not even a guest yet, and we might be able to ask them that down the track. So anything you want to hear about, anything you want answered, send it through at the Vision Board Podcast at gmail.com. Before we go, major sponsors, the Jackrabbit Slim's Barber Shop and the Organic Trainer. Yeah, Organic Trainer, www.theorganictrainer.com for all of your exercise tea needs. As you're proceeding to the checkout, type in keyword the Fit Coach to receive 10% off all of your purchases. If you're living in the Sydney, Australia area, stop by Jackrabbit Slim's Barber Shop in Kings Cross and Potts Point and set an appointment up with Dre. He'll leave you feeling fresh and so clean. Well, guys, I know you've definitely enjoyed that. That was John Wayne Parr. If you haven't yet, go back to episode eight. Check out John Goodman. Great speaker, great Dude, entrepreneur. John Wayne Parr is like, seriously, a, like, they write the characters in martial arts movies. He's the he's real, the ver- he's the real guy. So if you don't know this guy, check, you know, YouTube him, Google him. Um, and the, way, the thing I like, the way he carries himself. Yeah. And it, it, it matters to him how he's perceived, which is really important. Definitely. Well, next episode, we've got Billy the Kid Dib. Um, one after that, we're going international. We've got two internationals in a row. We've got former, uh, former champion, mid, junior middleweight champion, Austin Trout. He owns a victory over Miguel Cotto. He's been in the ring with um, Canelo Alvarez. He was meant to fight Anthony Mundine. That fell through. But uh, he's one of the, the pound-for-pound champions in the world. And then we've got the karate hottie. We've got Michelle Waterson. Yeah, Michelle Waterson's one of the toughest uh, women on the planet. There's a couple people, and you look at the uh, best women fighters there are, and she's in the top five. So I'm really excited about that one. Yeah, definitely. So we're going international. So stay tuned. The only way you're going to stay tuned is if you subscribe. So subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. But we'll see you soon. Peace. Peace. The Vision Board Podcast, hosted by Johnny Stofko and Tristan Cannell.